Hi, everyone. Hi. <laughs> um, I just wanted to start by really just expressing my deep gratitude for being invited to be here and sharing the space with all of you. Um, thank you so much to Ayanna Thompson for really spearheading the Race Before Race Symposia. Um, and all of my fellow speakers. It's a real honor to be included on the program with you. I've been learning so much. Um, and of course, I did want to thank Terry Kessler for all of her work coordinating all of our travels here um, and the board of Race Before Race for, of course, all that you're doing. Um, okay, so I was originally going to focus the topic of my talk today on how medieval studies continually appropriates and erases the work of medievalists of color, specifically within the field's recent movement for racial justice. This is a dynamic that I have noticed, and I know many of us in this room have noticed as well. And so it angers me a lot, and I know it angers many of you. But in the course of writing that paper, I realized I wanted to actually pivot away from my anger or perhaps better put, I wanted to use my anger to help me pivot towards something more hopeful um, and toward you know, radical transformation. So although I will open my talk with a discussion about this appropriation of medievalists of color's work, it is only a starting point. Because ultimately, I want to think about how this appropriation is perhaps inevitable within our current system. And if this is the case, this inevitability, then what I really want to focus on are strategies for the radical transformation of that system. So last October, Fordham University Press released a collection of essays titled, Who's Middle Ages? Now, Who's Middle Ages introduces the Middle Ages to students and other non-experts while also foregrounding the harmful ways that white supremacist movements have appropriated the Middle Ages throughout various points in history. I love this concept, and of course, I think it is precisely the way that the Middle Ages should be taught and presented. In fact, for all of those reasons, I decided to blurb the book when they asked. But nonetheless, it is not perfect, and one significant problem, which I did discuss with the editors, is that even as it aims to fight against white supremacist appropriation, it is itself engaging in a harmful act of appropriation. Its entire existence was made possible through the anti-racist discourse that medievalists of color have been forging for years now. Yet it only includes two essays by medievalists of color. And just to put all of my cards on the table here, I really felt this on a personal level. Because even though my work is cited in the book as inspiring some of the essays, and even though I was asked to blurb, to blurb the book, <laughs> I was not asked to contribute an essay and have my voice directly inform its discourse. Instead, the introduction was written by a white male scholar, thus once again positioning the white male voice as authoritative in, even in a discussion about racism. To my mind, this book seemed a glaring example of precisely the problem of white medieval studies capitalizing on the anti-racist work medievalists of color have been doing for a long time, well before the topic became a hot one. In an email exchange with Sita, Sita Shiganti, who's um, right over here, um, Sita helped me to understand the dynamic at play here. In an email to myself and the editors, she explained that the publisher seemed to rush production because of their, quote, perception that this is a hot and profitable topic they should claim for themselves as quickly as possible. And I should just note really quick. <laughs> right. I should note that I did get um, Dr. Shiganti's permission to share this email. Um, so, uh, Dr. Shiganti then went on to analyze the title itself, highlighting how, quote, the possessive adjective whose reveals more than it no doubt intends about the role of property, ownership, and profit in all of this. Thank you, Sita. Um, this collection, despite its undeniably good intentions to do important anti-racist work, nonetheless could not escape the talons of racial capitalism. What Sita's words here helped me see was that it was less about doing anti-racist work and more about owning ideas and discourse. 
specifically from medievalists of color. Work that in the past could ostracize us in this field has actually become a hot commodity, and the question of who gets to control and own this commodity is very much at stake. We saw something similar play out with the Dating Beowulf collection, where Adam Miyashiro's work was appropriated. Now, this is a sinister form of plagiarism where one is actually left without avenues for legal or formal redress. Yesterday, I sent this paper to my friend and one of the Race Before Race board members, Shaku Faber today, because I needed a trusted pair of eyes before coming up here in front of you all. Um, and she uh, sent me back a reply um, offering me this quote from Sarah Ahmed's new book, What's the Use on the Uses of Use? A quote, appropriation is justified as getting the most use from what is available to use, as stopping what is held in common from being wasted or becoming waste. And in our dialogue, Shakufe also offered this astute analysis that I would like to share, and I, did, I got her permission as well. What is so haunting, what is so haunting about this definition is that in appropriating the work of medievalists of color without including them, they essentially show that they believe that this work will become waste, unseen or unread, if it is not reinscribed through whiteness. And what is scary about this is that it is true. Because of the way the field is set up, we speak, but in this field as it is structured, unless white people listen, unless white people use what we speak and make it a product through their whiteness, it is as if we have not spoken. And she uses the word haunting here, and I think there is really no better word to describe this dynamic. But as I said, I do not want to only lay out my grievances about this, but to also understand why this keeps happening and how we can change it. So in my own efforts to better understand this issue, I want to turn to the work of Paula Yonide, which helped me view the dynamics of this appropriation through an ontology of whiteness, through white supremacy itself. In her article, Defensive Appropriations, Yonide deconstructs how the police, white student unions, and the alt-right use appropriative tactics to fabricate self-victimization and thereby take a defensive stance against people of color. For example, she delineates the way the creation of the phrase Blue Lives Matter invents a false equivalence between black and brown people's hyper-vulnerability to police killings and police officers' vulnerability to dying in the line of duty. Yonide's formulation of defensive appropriations works well for understanding why and how white supremacists fashion themselves into victims and embattled minorities fighting against this myth that they have called white genocide. So as many of us know, um, as white supremacists converged in Charlottesville in the name of protecting what they deem white heritage, they did so wielding Confederate flags and medieval imagery. Featured prominently was the Ethel rune, meaning heritage and inheritance, particularly in relation to homeland. This rune was the official symbol of the Prinz Eugen wing of the Nazi party in Croatia. And here you can see a uh, Nazi officer wearing it as an insignia on his collar. Today, it is featured heavily within white supremacist circles as it has become the emblem of the neo-Nazi National Socialist Movement. Oh, I'm sorry. It is a common tattoo and has even been commercialized. One company, named Tightrope Records, sells products branded with various white supremacist symbols, including shirts and buttons, with the Ethel rune. A Thor hammer with runes on it, and a shirt that overlays the Confederate flag on the uh, Celtic cross. The company's tagline is, it's not illegal to be white, dot, 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 yet. Which reflects the myth of white genocide. And the rhetoric of legality here is very telling. They fear losing the power that their whiteness gives them, and they understand the centrality of the legal system in upholding that power. Yonide reminds us that whiteness is a category defined by, quote, the right to, use, the right to use and enjoyment, as Cheryl Harris has put it. I'm sorry, that's a quote from Cheryl Harris, um, 
not Yonide. But Yonide draws on Harris's foundational theory of whiteness as property to explain that, quote, this is a form of property that gives whiteness the exclusive right to move about the world unrestrained, the right to leverage one's will and privileges, to enjoy life as one sees fit without being encumbered on the basis of race, end quote. She further explains, the fusion between white identity and property is so tightly bound that when white property advantages and entitlements suffer from the effects of deindustrialization, globalization, climate chaos, the corporate elite's greed, as well as demographic, cultural, and political shifts that decenter whiteness, white identity loses the primary basis on which it has historically constructed its self-worth and hope. Now, I think I should pause here, crucially, and say that I do not want to ally to the differences between liberal academia and white hate groups. These differences are huge and very, very important, of course. But what I do want to do is push the idea that it is whiteness that structures both of these things. They manifest differently, but it is the same structure. So insofar as white supremacy is the hegemonic system in which we all live and work, whether we, we are looking at a hate group or a field of study, the property of whiteness will necessarily govern our social, economic, and personal relations. Within this system, racial justice movements are appropriated to serve, not tackle, the white hege hegemony. Hegemony. I, I never know how to pronounce that. As infuriating as this is, it is not unusual. Even the best of us become trapped by its mechanics. When the editors and publisher of Who's Middle Ages put together their volume, they did so within a field of study governed by a capitalist white supremacist system. And within this system, the kind of anti-racist discourse we have been building becomes a commodity to be owned and profited from rather than used to build new structures. Now, Yonide uh, ends her article on defensive appropriations with this very eloquent and hopeful passage, which I want to offer as a way of framing how we might envision the radical transformation of a field that is moored by the same ontology of whiteness that has fabricated white dispossession within hate groups. Intracommunal movement building is where transformations in ways of seeing being and relating have the potential to take place. It is where everyday people who are enraged by the injustices they witness come to figure out the difficult work of transforming local institutions, consider tactical ways to hold police departments accountable, and most pertinent to us here, create educational settings for people to deepen their analysis. It is where people determine whether they are capable of trusting and loving each other in ways that are fundamentally anathema to the ontology of whiteness, which privileges forms of relating that breed division, hierarchy, and individualist self-aggrandizement. Now, I'm going to come back to this quote later at the end, um, but now I, I want to shift a little bit to thinking about the global turn in medieval studies and how the global has perhaps the potential to transform our field. And what I want to emphasize is that this process of transformation requires that the global is not simply, as someone put it uh, yesterday, a euphemism for diversity, which we all know that it is being used that way, um, that it is not simply a rebranding of the same old system. In fact, the oxymoron of the term global medieval needs to be taken very seriously. So at the last race before race, Mary Rambaran Olm powerfully announced her resignation as 2VP of the organization formerly known as the International Society of Anglo-Saxon Studies which immediately inspired a long overdue and important conversation about the politics of naming. ISAS became ISXS, XX, as the organization tried to rebrand itself by shedding the part of its name that carries and perpetuates legacies of racism and white nationalism. But as Dr. Rambaran Olm has emphasized, the problem isn't only the name, a topical issue that can easily be remedied with a simple name change. 
The organization's name, and indeed medieval studies itself, my argument, is intimately wrapped up in the project of white identity creation, one that relies on a partnership between knowledge production, academia, and socio-political power structures, white supremacy. The controversy over naming ISXX exposed academia's investment in white supremacy not only because a medievalist organi organization still used a racist term, but also because what that term named, the institutional production of white heritage, could not be easily dislodged. In an effort to break from conceptions of the Middle Ages as a white space and time that witnessed minimal cross-cultural contact, the larger field of medieval studies has attempted this global turn. But as this, new, as this new field emerges and the global medieval becomes ubiquitous, it may be time to query whether medieval and even the Middle Ages as a term are limiting the, are limiting the um, I'm sorry, are, li are limiting terms that name racist epistemologies. As we know, medieval is a temporal construct that is inextricably tied to the spatial constructs of Western Europe. Speculum, which is issued by the Medieval Academy of America has, and is considered by many in the field to be the most prestigious journal that we have, describes the traditional purview of the field on their webpage for guideline for submissions, which I'm just, I wanna to read to y'all. So Speculum, published quarterly since 1926, was the first scholarly journal in North America devoted exclusively to the Middle Ages. It is open to contributions in all fields studying the Middle Ages, a period ranging from approximately 500 to 1500. The primary emphasis is on Western Europe. But Arabic, Byzantine, Hebrew, and Slavic studies are also included. The language of publication is English. The Middle Ages as a concept centers Western European history and culture. While other specific studies are included peripherally, they are not the emphasis of the journal, just as they are not captured by the construct of the Middle Ages. According to Speculum's self-description, unless it were linked back to Western Europe, an article on the Mongol Yuan dynasty, for example, would not be published in this elite journal. The medieval is not merely a designation of time, but one of space as well. The space it marks is specifically Western Europe, and just as Western Europe has been constructed through what Bell Hooks has so incisively named the imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy, so too does the medieval carry this valence of power and oppression. The MAA and the field more broadly is adopting the discourse and frameworks of the global in order to disrupt this current notion of the Middle Ages as white, European, and geographically isolated from the African and Asian continents. At the same time, this global turn has become a method by which medievalists aim to foster inclusive classrooms and thereby cultivate a more diverse pipeline into the professoriate. But adding global to medieval offers a tenuous solution, I think. Europe is never going to not be signified by the medieval and centered within its framework. It is a construct that is only legible within European time and space. Even as the global medieval expands the traditional purview of medieval studies outward, it brings the world centripetally back to Western Europe and risks enabling a new method of epistemological colonialism. Geraldine Heng, who brought this concept to the forefront of the field and has thought about the global medieval for decades, has suggested that we move toward the term early globalities as an alternative, thereby shutting a restrictive Eurocentric term when studying an interconnected past. But I want to ask, what, to what extent does eliminating medieval erase the concept that it names? To go back to Dr. Rambaran Olm's point about ISA, IS, um, AS. That is, to what extent does the field still remain marked by an ontology of whiteness? Okay, so in the wake of Charlottesville, public medievalist discourse quickly established a dichotomy between us and them. Addressing his fellow academics, historian David Perry offered guidance on, quote, what to do when Nazis are obsessed with your field. That's the title of, of his uh, article. 
uh, before discussing his own realization that his love for medieval castles was shared by white supremacists on Stormfront, he describes an innocent field beset by racism. Quote, there have been some bad actors among the profession, and there's a collection of right-wing thinkers in certain subfields, but mostly we're just a collection of predominantly white scholars who are surprised and dis disturbed uh, to discover our classes and books might, well, might be well received by white supremacists. Having discovered it, the question is what to do, end quote. Having rhetorically pushed racism outward and, <laughs> and reduced um, what remains to a batch of bad apples, Perry focuses on the insiders who are left to mobilize against an external threat. He ends his essay with an action plan for his colleagues. Quote, our solutions to this problem include explicitly signaling our rejection of racism and working harder to diversify the field, but also dethroning the very notion of the Middle Ages, mostly Christian, mostly located in Western Europe, isolated from other peoples. Perry's three-pronged plan is precisely right. But missing is an analysis of how this notion of the Middle Ages that he is talking about is intimately linked with the field that created it, and how his call to dethrone it also depends on dethroning the notion of white innocence, or here, medievalist innocence. In On Being Included, Racism and Diversity in Institutional Life, Sarah Ahmed has eloquently described the predicament Perry's essay exemplifies. She writes, quote, the reduction of racism to the figure of the racist allows structural or institutional forms of racism to recede from view. By projecting racism onto a figure that is easily discarded, not only as someone who is not me, but also as someone who is not us, who does not represent a cultural or institutional norm. Right after a racist incident, people will often say, this is not who we are. But there is something about who we are that engendered the incident in the first place. This rhetoric serves an important function. As Ahmed puts it, one of the best ways you can deflect attention from racism is to hear racism as an accusation. When racism is heard as accusation, then public relations becomes an exercise. The response takes the form of a defense of individual or institutional reputation the language of diversity becomes easily mobilized as a defense of reputation, perhaps even a defense of whiteness, end quote. So in many ways, I think we can understand the global turn in medieval studies as a diversity initiative that addresses the problem of white supremacist appropriation. It accomplishes the aim of dethroning the idea that the Middle Ages was white, Christian, and Western European, and it invites the participation of more scholars of color. In doing both of these things, it also seems to signal a rejection of racist ideologies. But does it interrogate the uncomfortable ways in which white supremacy underscores medieval studies? As Ahmed's work warns us, an emphasis on diversity can inadvertently lead us to develop more robust ways of protecting the exclusionary power structures we think we are fighting against. Diversity initi ini initiatives often prioritize an institution's reputation, in this case, that of medieval studies, rather than the targets of racism. When diversity becomes a strategic tool of response towards bad will, as something that garners goodwill between institutions and the public, it can mask the racism that continues to operate beneath the surface. Disrupting the narrative of a white Middle Ages, or dethroning it, to use David Perry's term, protects medieval studies from accusations of racism. But it does little to address racism itself. Racism is about the structural ways in which people of color have been disenfranchised by various forms of violence and oppression. Anti-racist strategies for correcting racist appropriations must necessarily address structural change within the institutions that have facilitated racist appropriations to begin with. In other words, as we assert that medievalists don't only study and promote the histories of white people, we also overlook how we do promote whiteness 
through the disciplinary construct of the medieval. As educators and researchers, as knowledge producers, we have the power to make change. This is where we can sort of find the hope. We have this power. But we have to remember that white supremacy is not something remote. It isn't them versus us. It's right here. It is medieval studies. If we want to be anti-racist, we need to start thinking more radically about how we can reformulate our field in our teaching, graduate training, and public outreach. These priorities will necessarily require structural transformation and institutional change. For the global medieval to affect anti-racist change within medieval studies, its formulation must exceed curricular diversification and confront how whiteness inheres within the medieval. That is, the global cannot merely mark a project of spatial expansion, even as that is necessarily part of it, whether we name this shift in the field global medieval or early globalities, which I do like, um, the central aims, the central aim is, must be to critique medieval Europe's position in space and time. Geraldine Heng has adopted Wai Chi Dimmick's formulation of deep time to theorize the temporal implications of the global medieval. She argues that, quote, Oh, I'm sorry, she argues that global temporalities break down narratives of European and modern exceptionalism, making space for non-Eurocentric epistemologies to emerge. We may also borrow from Michelle Wright's theory of, of epiphenomenal time in black studies, which models how space-time can disrupt oppressive narratives of knowledge specifically in regard to racial identities. Wright's conceptualization of blackness, which transforms it from a what to a when or where, is born through the epiphenomenal framework, which, quote, quote, in which the past, present, and future are always interpreted. Wright locates, quote, the black collective in history and in the specific moment in which blackness is being imagined, the now through which all imaginings of blackness will be mediated, end quote. This framework can help us think through how to study race using the global medieval as a methodology, where as a methodology, it can open space-time beyond Europe and beyond the medieval, while accounting for an embodied present and envisioning a different future at the same time. So I'm now going to turn to the question section of the session. Um, and I want to circle back to Yonide here. Um, to go back to how I started this talk, I did not, I really did not want to write a paper only about the appropriation of our work within the field and in the profession, really, um, that operates through racial capitalism because, honestly, I am tired of feeling hopeless. Um, I am tired of feeling resentful of the state of the field about both its legacies of racism as well as its current structures of racial inclusion. So with this aim and desire um, toward hope, I want to emphasize Yonide's point about intracommunal movement building. And I just want to reread um, re a section from that quote I, I pulled earlier. Intracommunal movement building is where people determine whether they are capable of trusting and loving each other in ways that are fundamentally anesma to the ontology of whiteness. So just to open this up, I noticed yesterday and today what's so wonderful about this event is how, the, while we have senior scholars and very established scholars, we also have lots of students, um, both undergraduate and graduate, and we have high school teachers. Um, and so there's really a diversity here of um, you know, interge intergenerational expertise um, and knowledge. And so I, I know we've do, been doing you know, the question and answer more traditional, but I really did want to reverse the room here and sort of ask you all to talk about different strategies and methods that you've used um, from your particular vantage point that have, that, that have been helpful in building these intercommunal sort of movements um, and whether they worked or didn't work, you know, because I think we learn as much through, um, you know, our struggles and our failures as we do through our successes. So I don't know if we could start on that and then of course I'm happy to take traditional um, questions as well. Thank you.
Thank you, Sierra. Um, this is a really interesting provocation, and so I, I feel like I have a, I have sort of a further provocation for the audience. Um, to, but I'm, I'm curious about. I'm also curious about whether people think about this. And it seems like in, you know, in the passage, there's um, a sort of, you know, there's, there's a, there's a really explicit reference to tactics for things in the world, right? You know, tactics to protest police violence, to protest, you know, and there's many, like, you know, um, unjust sentencing. There are a lot of different things that we could think about there, you know. Um, and I feel like one of the things that I've been trying to think through is how to create stronger, both sort of conceptual and actual connections between like what I'm doing as a medievalist, you know, um, and these other kinds of direct action, you know, um, and I think like talking to people in more contemporary fields, I feel like sometimes that bridge is a little easier for them, you know, um, because they are, you know, just because they feel there's an immediacy in what they, you know, in the material they, the scholarly material they work on. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I just want, I just maybe as a, as a sort of further inflection of your provocation, I'm curious about that too, just how people, um, how people have thought about that in their own lives. Yeah, does anybody have an answer for that? No, <laughs> um, no I mean, I, 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 what you're saying resonates with me. I mean, as, a, as a, someone who works on the Middle Ages, like, you know, our materials can seem very esoteric, right? And I think as I was coming up in graduate school, um, certainly that is the... Um, that is the sense that you get in your training. Um, we kind of, we, we, don't, we don't try to fight against that, that distance. Um, we sort of embrace it. Um, and that has done us a disservice in, in, in exactly what you're talking about, building these connections. Um, not only just outside the world, but also with our colleagues in academia. Um, you know, I don't need to tell pre-modernists, right, how, how people in the academy sort of, uh, who, who aren't pre-modernists sort of see us. Um, you know, Dr. Little talked about this yesterday, right? Um, that we, um, that, that race is seen as something that is not, we don't, what, we're just playing when we talk about it, right? Um, but I will say that, you know, the, the appropriation of the Middle Ages out in the real world, um, and several of you have shown, you know, really disturbing images of how it has been leveraged, weaponized, um, and led to murderous violence. Um, and oppression, there is a very clear connection. Um, and it's, it's unfortunate, you know, disgustingly so, how a academia has sort of sprung up these structures to sort of, sort of like cordon us off from that reality. So, but I would love to know, yeah, other people, other medievalists, you know, early modernists who have um, f found these connections that Sita's talking about. Thank you so much for this talk. And I feel like you, you got me to be able to articulate something that's sort of been um, at the tip of my tongue through the whole weekend, which is that there's a way that there's a zero sum game in capitalism that becomes the operator for this ontology of yeah. whiteness. And if we connect that to the place of the university, it, I mean, you know, and the adjuncting and the, you know, the kind of surplus labor that comes with intellectual work that is you know, mechanized, it's enabled by a capitalist frame of, of the zero-sum game, um, that until we see the, our place of work as a public good, like a shared public good, yeah. um, and opt out in some way, I mean, this is a fantasy, I guess, but opt out of like that sense of um, playing the entrepreneurial kind of mechanism of, of surplus labor that it's asking us to do repeatedly, right? This is how our boards are chosen, boards of our trees are chosen from the business world to run what is a public good and oftentimes the people who are not hurt are in the humanities. Um, so I just think, you know, I, I thank you for allowing like sort of this connection of how, um, you know, what is, what is the operating system of this ontology because it isn't just a philosophical stand, right? It's absolutely mechanized in a really, um, everyday manner, right? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, these are things that I've sort of come to over many years of thinking about just really how competition works in academia and how grueling it is and how, you know, it, it really builds so much division. But the structures of academia depend on it. 
um, you know, to get a job, the job market. It's so horrendous that, you know, people need to make sure, you know, they have to protect their ideas or they have to steal, you know, they feel like they have to steal ideas to get ahead. And, you know, that when we're talking about real humanity, we're talking about humanity and we're talking about, you know, people, when we're talking about humanity, we cannot have racial capitalism be governing our relations. You know, um, it's really sad. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of, thank you so much. There's, there's so many things that I was thinking about and tweeting, I'll admit, while you were speaking. <laughs> um, just a short form kind of processing. But one thing that I've, uh, I, the program that I went through um, really developed kind of a, a, a way of breaking away a linear telling always of, of history and understanding of periodization and breaking free from that and thinking more along the lines of constellations. Yeah. And, um, you know, really, uh, I mean, even now uh, teaching a course, uh, because I, I don't get to teach pre-modern subjects right now, but of, I'm teaching about the Nazi period. So, but for me, you know, even though there's this textbook that wasn't chosen by me because, you know, I'm just a contingent faculty member, right? But pushing them to move in directions where they move backwards, tracing this, that this isn't something that, you know, this white supremacy, this didn't, you know, we take steps backward and forward, and that it's not necessarily lin linearly devised, and it's not always that it is this line that remains unbroken. It may hide in the shadows, it may come That's out right. here and there, and so even finding text, you know, Stranger in the Village, James Baldwin, that essay, is incredibly powerful when we're talking about German, German colonization and kind of taking these steps back of looking at white supremacy, Nazism. And you can trace it back, but you also, I, I think that that's in many ways we limit ourselves in that what can speak to students and where they can kind of find this in linking it even through a word or linking it through this concept or imagery, you know, all of these things. And I think that, not that we can't, but it, it, do what we want to, but that these things do speak to one another. Even if it's written now, it's not as if it is, this, we, this is a legacy, right? The, this, the medievalism's continues on, right? And so if it's continuing to be referenced, I think we, we also need to think about ways that we can kind of really highlight and expose these connections like we've seen at this mm -hmm. conference within our courses. Yeah. Thank you. And I, and I will say that that has been so refreshing at this conference to see that, you know, we all sh share these premises. You know, I f often find that sometimes when you're talking about these things um, in more traditional spaces in academia for our fields of study, um, we have to fight just to make, put that premise out there that there is a connection. Um, and here, you know, coming in, it was immediately apparent to me that we all know. And that's really where I think, you know, it's just, it's just so wonderful that you're doing this. <laughs> Thank you for the, uh, right here. Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you for the wonderful uh, talk. Um, so there seems to be just this, uh, this overwhelming sense of a grand mechanism of whiteness, um, specifically a cisgender, heterosexual, able-bodied, white, male hegemony. Um, and this thing sort of just is a cyclical production and reproduction of whiteness, and it's disseminated through all of its various institutions, whether it be, as you pointed out, uh, capitalism. That's sort of a symptom of whiteness. And academia is very much so a symptom of whiteness. And to sort of have Cheryl Harris's work in conversation with all of this um, is really important because whiteness as a property means that it's something that you can divest from. And so this is just me positing this to the entire room. You're all aware now. There really isn't an excuse. So if your proximity to whiteness is very beneficial to you and you have classrooms filled with you know, people of color, BIPOC individuals, you have to make that you know, decision to embolden them and to empower them and to, uh, to make sure that there is some sort of, to borrow from E.M. Forrester's uh, short story, the machine has to stop. Thank you, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, for several, a couple years now, I've been feeling there is no excuse anymore. Even if you don't come to Race Before Race, even if you are not, you know, this is not your scholarship that you're devoting, you know, your time to in, in that way, um, you are teaching undergraduates. You have graduate students that you're mentoring. There is no excuse. You cannot perpetuate the same cycle. Yeah. Hi, Sierra. Thank Hi. you for such a great talk, and thank you for all the work that you do. Your work enables a lot of our work, so I think we're all very appreciative of you. Um, the one thing I wanted to say when you were asking sort of about a strategic question, right, when it comes to teaching, not simply expanding. I mean, you know that I'm teaching in India now, and so we basically designed our literature major from scratch, and so we specifically called it the literature major and not the English major, because yeah. even though we are teaching in English, we are trying to decenter sort of English canonicity, right, um, because we, ha we have Indian students, and we are in India, right, so it doesn't make any sense to sort of reproduce those structures of canonicity for them, right? But this takes me to the question of like our global turn in medieval studies, right? Because something that Amrita Dar said in MLA was that there's no post-colonial, there's only neo-colonial, yeah. right? And so with the global, right, I mean, how do we avoid reproducing this idea of the West and then the rest, mm -hmm. right? Because that seems to sort of be happening in the turn to the global Middle Ages. So I was wondering if you had some thoughts about that specifically. Well, when I first, I, I, I don't have answers to that. I mean, these are my same questions, as you know. Um, but uh, when I first started you know, working on my dissertation and thinking about the global, um, I just sort of tacked it on to my work. I was like, yeah, what I do is global. You know, I'm talking about the Mongols and I'm reading outside of Europe and um, my archive is outside of Europe. Um, but then, you know, you quickly realize when you start researching and you start really thinking deeply about your, the your theoretical frameworks, um, how problematic that is, especially coming from an English department. Um, you know, we think of the global as being, you know, a, like, a, like someone said, a euphemism for diversity. Um, that, you know, it's an answer to racism and et cetera. Um, but how could that be so? I mean, colonialism is global. You know, there are many harmful things that are global. And um, like I was trying to get at, the construct of the medieval is harmful. Um, you know, it, it is a construct, right? And it, it is something that has arisen specifically within the context of nationalism and Europe and colonialism, as um, Eduardo was talking about yesterday. And so just putting global on isn't going to solve our problems. What I find helpful is Geraldine Heng's work um, where she's talking about the global as sort of a methodology for actually breaking apart the medieval. Um, and I find Michelle Wright's work in Black Studies, which she doesn't talk about medieval stuff at all, uh, well, she does actually, but no, she's not a medievalist, I should say. Um, you know, th thinking about how these multiple temporalities come together in also destabilizing our spatial constructs. And that really is a way of breaking out of some of this sort of, some of these oppressive structures. But it does take a lot of work um, and commitment and really intercommunal movement building. Because we all, we can't be fighting over ideas, you know, through, through this racial capitalist profit economy, like in order to make this change. This is not about hot topics that will get us jobs or get us published in the most prestigious journals. It's about changing the way that we produce knowledge. It's about changing the way that we live in the world, right? So, I mean, the stakes are really high. Um, but yeah, that's all I got, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Sierra. I'm Lehua. <laughs> uh, um, that was a really important talk, and I, I just, I'm so glad you just said what you said because I've been trying to be a good student and take the, the uh, reversed classroom seriously and thinking about what it is to try to produce knowledge differently. And, you know, if, if we're thinking about dismantling our relationship as scholars who want to train other scholars, especially scholars, from backgrounds that have been traditionally excluded from access to the resources, it, it, it really then starts to, like, I talk about this with my 
um, dear friend and colleague at the University of Hawaii, um, about why the colonial institution will not brook the kind of work we want to do. And we talk about like how, like do we have to then start a different kind of institution? I mean, I'm an independent scholar in part because I can't, I personally can't brook that anymore. And, and yet I wouldn't be here without people in the institutions leveraging in this kind of, you know, subversive, transformative um, use of the resources. So, so when we think about in, intra-communal movement building, I wonder too if, if we can link this, especially for the young scholars in the room, about like what is it? Like, can we just like take away this alt act for the moment, not to disregard the history of that, but really think about how the training in this room is so necessary for our world right now, and that we need to be able to perpetuate it with younger people who can infiltrate all parts of our worlds and our societies and our professions. Because if we don't do it, we see what happens when the powerful only think as far back as yesterday, right? And, and the diversity of knowledge is produced through the linguistic diversity of the training of the medievalist or the early modernist is lacking in most policy and legal discussions in this country alone, right? Let alone in Geneva or where, you know, down at New York in the UN. So um, I don't, I mean, I don't know that I have any solutions, but I, I wonder if we can continue to talk about how we facilitate this diversification with the aim to train and expand and encourage and support an infiltrative resistance. It's not resistance, infiltration. Like. Infiltration, yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. I agree with you. <laughs> um, you know, these are all the, the questions, you know, and I, I do think that it is an infiltration, but in a, you know, that word has some, such not negative connotations, but it has negative connotations within a certain kind of system, um, right? Um, I think for all of us here, that is sort of what we are doing. We are from the inside making changes with, you know, even just how students first come to know these materials. Um, so for example, teaching Chaucer, I think can be hugely problematic if we don't talk about how Chaucer became Chaucer in the white male patriarchal cis hetero um, canon. Um, and then that's the, that's the beginning point for understanding and reading beautiful poetics and fun stories, right? You have to understand the context and the framework that these materials are um, being presented to you. And that, you know, Middle English, um, Shakespeare, you know, these texts were used to colonize people um, and rip people of their heritages and cultures. And, you know, when we talk about cultural capitalism, you know, for s students often at the Ivies and things like that, like talk about cultural capitalism, like learning Chaucer so that you can like, you know, move through elite spaces, that kind of a thing. Like we need to disrupt that, you know. And it, it does take people from the inside, I think. Um, but also listening to people on the outside. And, and building those kinds of connections. Yeah. All right, so that takes us to time. Okay. So can we have a, another huge round of applause for Dr. Lomito? Thank you, thank you all.